Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome again to Amazing Adventure, a journey for life with Jesus. I'd like to welcome all of our young people that are here this evening, and also our friends who are joining us across the country and around the world, part of our amazing discovery journey into Bible truth. Now, tonight we have a very important topic. It's entitled The Only Lifeboat. Now, whenever you go on a ship, especially at sea, especially the big ships, they always have lifeboats in case something happens along the way and the ship begins to sink and people need to climb into the lifeboat. And so our topic tonight is talking about a way of escape called The Only Lifeboat. Very important study. But before we get to our study this evening, we're going to sing our theme song, Life is an Adventure, and I'm going to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. Now, in the past, when Pastor Doug has come out, he has rung the bell, and when Pastor Doug, wait, wait, when Pastor Doug rings the bell, I want us all to say, good evening, Pastor Doug, all right? So listen for the bell. Here it is. Good evening, Pastor Doug. All right. That's better. Good evening. Are you ready for a, an, an adventure tonight? Yeah. I think we're going to stand together. We're going to sing our song. We are. Time. Let's stand and we invite our song leaders to come forward. Life is an adventure. remain standing just a moment. We'll have our prayer person pray and then our scripture person. All right. The scripture. I'm going to invite, let's see, we have Grace that's going to be doing our prayer this morning. Come on forward, Grace. Grace is from Virginia. She's 13 years old. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father in heaven, please help us to think of you in all our words, actions, and thoughts today so others may see you and us. We are so thankful for amazing adventures and what you're doing in this camp meeting. Please help put your words in Pastor Bachelor's mouth tonight so that you may touch our hearts and lives. In your merciful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Grace. We're going to have Thank our you, Bible singers. reader. Thank you, singers. You can make your way down. Uh, we're going to have Daniel come forward. He's got our scripture reading for today. And the scripture reading is going to be from Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is neither other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. No other name. No other name except the name of Jesus by which we must be saved. I'll tell you a quick story about that verse. Yes. Just came to me, sorry. There was a man who was blind and he wanted to preach for Jesus. So he stood on the corner in New York City on a box and he preached the Bible while he was reading from Braille. You know, a Braille Bible has got little bumps in it so they can read the pages. And all he had was a New Testament. And he was reading to the people from his Braille Bible, and some people stopped and listened. And one man who was an atheist, having all kinds of problems in his life, and he was wondering what the answer was, 
he was walking by. He stopped to watch the blind man read the Bible from Braille and the blind man lost his place. He was saying, there is no other name and he lost his place. He said, no other name, no other name, no other name but the name of Jesus. And that man couldn't get that out of his mind. He kept thinking, no other name, no other name. He went home and he got on his knees and he prayed and he accepted Jesus and it changed his life. That Amen. Verse. That's a powerful verse. Changes mm -hmm. people's lives. Well, we do have some Bible questions that people have asked that some other young people have asked. And so we're going to take a look at those video Bible questions. Our first one for this evening. My name is Noah Miller and I'm 11 years old and I'm from Conroe, Texas. And my question is, will we all have the same names in heaven? All right. So the question, do we all have the same names when we get to heaven? Like if I'm Pastor Doug on earth, am I going to be Doug or Douglas in heaven? Uh, you know, the Bible tells us, Revelation, Jesus says he gives us a new name. Can you think of some people in the Bible who were given new names? Peter was given a new name. Abraham's name went from Abram to Abraham. Peter was, Jacob was given the name Israel. Yeah, so, oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like Babylon too. So do you believe, can God give us a new name? Yeah, you know what my name's going to be? Wilbur. No, I just made that up. Everybody's going to get a new name in heaven. And we don't know, it'll, he's going to give us a white stone with a new name on it. Okay, our next question that we have. Hi, my name is Sarai Simmons. I'm from Crofton, Maryland, and I'm nine years old. My Bible question is, how do you give your heart to God? Oh, probably one of the most important questions that somebody can ask. How do you give your heart to God? When we say heart, often people think about an emotional feeling. They think about your heart here. They think about a Valentine's heart. In the Bible, when it says giving your heart to God, it, it tells us in the Word of God, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Do you think with your pump or with your head? When you give your heart to God, you are giving your mind to God. You're saying, Lord, I am choosing to trust you. I believe in you. I thank you for your love. Lord, I'm helpless unless you help me. Be honest with God and say, I belong to you. Will you change me? Will you forgive me? And when you do that, you are giving your heart to God. It's a choice to make, to give your life to him and ask for his forgiveness. And will he answer that prayer? This is our subject tonight, so you'll learn more about that. Okay, very good. Our next question that we have. Hi, my name is Samuel. I'm 12 years old from California. And I want to know, is it possible to live without sin? All right, another important question. Is it possible for a person to live without sinning? Who first tempted Adam and Eve to sin? Satan. The devil. Does the devil still tempt people to sin? When the angel appeared to Mary and he said, you're going to have a son and you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Do we all believe the devil has the power to tempt us to sin? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus has the power to save you from sin? Yes. Who's more powerful, Jesus or the devil? Jesus. Now, if you're walking with the Lord and you fall, he'll forgive you. But you should always try as a Christian to be like Christ. You see, a Christian is not a follower of Christians. A Christian is a follower of Jesus. Was Jesus perfect? Yeah. The Bible says he did no sin. And so if you're following a perfect master, you will always become more and more like Jesus as you follow him. But if you say, oh, well, we're all sinners and so... Why try? Your standard of life is going to go down. So you always want to seek to be like Jesus and believe that he can keep you from falling. That's what it says in the book of Jude. He is able to keep you from falling. He can save you from your sins. Amen. All right. Our next question that we have. Hi, my name is Allie, and I'm from Texas. And my Bible question is, why do we choose the last yeah. Jesus? All right. The question there was, why does the Bible use a lamb to represent Jesus? You can see she's probably on a farm and there's some goats and some animals around. But why a lamb? Why does that symbolize Jesus? It sounds like the goat asked a question too, <laughs> halfway through. 
Well, you know, lambs, uh, it's interesting. God used several shepherds to become great leaders. Um, Abel, Abel was a shepherd. Uh, Moses was a shepherd. Joseph was a shepherd. Abraham was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. God taught those shepherds how to care for people by taking care of sheep. Because sheep, domestic modern sheep, are kind of helpless without someone to help protect them and guide them and feed them. And so she sheep have been domesticated for thousands of years, so they're very dependent. They're often innocent. You don't hear too often about a person on the news, someone was attacked and killed by a lamb today. <laughs> they're, they're usually pretty gentle animals. And, um, and so God picked this gentle, innocent animal to be a symbol of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, which we have a story about tonight. All right. Well, with that, Pastor Doug, we'll turn the time over to you. A very important lesson. Thank you so much, Pastor Ross. And thank you, everybody, both here in uh, the local church here in Michigan, as well as our friends who are watching via the Internet and others who may be looking in on television to our amazing adventure program. Our lesson tonight is talking about the only lifeboat. And so uh, God has a lifeboat by which he is going to save us. Now, remember our, our memory verse. Nor is there salvation in any other, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So years ago, back in 1914, they built one of the most beautiful ships that had ever been built. It was the biggest ship in the world at the time. You know what the name of it was? The Titanic. In my office in California, I've actually got a piece of coal that was on the Titanic that they recovered from the wreck that's 13,000 feet below the water. They brought up a bunch of things and someone had some coal. A friend of mine bought a little piece of the coal from the original Titanic and they gave, sent it to me as a gift. And it's a reminder that even though that ship had some of the very best and most modern technology of mankind, they said it was unsinkable. They said, we don't need very many lifeboats on the Titanic because we've built it with 16 waterproof compartments. And so even if it gets punctured here or there, it'll never sink. So they didn't put enough lifeboats on the ship. Well, you know the story. Four days into the first voyage, beautiful calm water at night, they were going too fast, maybe not paying attention, having too much fun partying on the boat, and they ran into an iceberg that cut the boat open from the bow, made a rip about 300 feet back, and water began to pour into all the different compartments, and they realized they didn't have enough lifeboats. The sad thing is, a lot of people did not want to get off the ship into the lifeboats they did have, so some of the first lifeboats that pushed off were almost empty. And then it was too late when people realized the boat was going to sink, and everybody was trying to crowd into the lifeboats, and uh, most of the people on the Titanic drowned because they were not thinking about the importance of the lifeboats. You know, the Bible tells us about a lifeboat that God made back early when he destroyed the world because of their sins. There was one lifeboat. Who was, who was the captain of that boat? Noah. Noah. And the boat was called the what? Ark. Noah's Ark. And there was only one boat. And you all had to be on that boat if you wanted to survive. Now, Noah and his family came. Most people didn't get on the lifeboat. But Noah not only took his family, what else did he take? He took some animals. You know, I just got a signal. I think we've got a guest visitor here tonight. And so, if I'm not mistaken, yep, sure enough, I've not even met this guest, but we just had someone come from Noah's Ark. Hi, is it Seth? Yes. And yes. Seth, and what do we have here? Well, this is a chinchilla, and his name is Mr. Chinchilla Man. Mr. So. Chinchilla Man, very creative, like Monty Python. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Got a lot of funny names, so. So he's a uh, chinchilla. These guys, they live near the volcanoes and stuff. So they got really soft fur, one of the softest furs of any mammal. So. Do they work hard to keep their coats clean? Yes, they do. They actually will roll around in volcanic ash to try and keep their coats clean. So. 
You know, that's a good lesson for us to do everything we can to keep our coats clean. Jesus gives us robes of righteousness, and we don't want to get them dirty. So can I pet them? Absolutely. Oh, they're so soft. Would, is it okay if I have a couple of kids come up? <laughs> now raise your hands if you have not raised your hand before, if, and if you've not been up here before. So who are some people? I was going to bring Isaac. You want to come up? All right, come on up here. Let me see. I'll get... Uh, Two or three. I'll let you come. You've not been up yet? No. All right. Well, there's other things. Hang tight. We got more happening here. Okay. Mr. Chinchilla. Now, is that the softest thing you've ever felt? Yes. So, well, tell us about some of their habits. What do they do? Well, uh, chinchillas, they really like to eat the grass that's on the mountains. So, they'll climb up and they like to keep it cool because they've got this big, thick fur. And they like to uh, hang out with other chinchillas, so you'll see them chatter with each other. And they're nocturnal, so they actually, you know, kind of like it more at the nighttime as opposed to so daytime. So he's just waking up right now. Oh, yes. He's and like, oh. Tell us, do they not eat fingers? Oh, no, no. Okay, I just want to make no, sure. No, they're, they're herbivores. <laughs> they love all the veggies. That's what they like. All right. Very, they're very sweet. You just could pet him all day, huh? They're not carnivores? No, nope. not nope. carnivores. Well, so, you, you would like one, huh? Oh, oh I get to ask that a <laughs> You'll lot, have to yeah. talk to your dad about mm -hmm. that later. Well, thank you. Let's all thank yeah, Seth for showing us Mr. Chinchilla. Yeah. Yeah. All right, kids, thanks. Yeah. Never dreamed we'd actually have a visitor from the ark. So Noah brought two of all of the uh, unclean animals. Clean animals were brought on the arks by seven. And after all the animals were on the ark... They went in just before the door shut. Noah stood in the door of the ark. And he said to any of the people, don't you want to be saved? Now is the time. And the people said, well, Noah, you've been talking about rain for 120 years. And we've never seen it rain. And there's no clouds in the sky. And we're not so sure it's going to rain. Maybe when we see the clouds, then we'll get on the ark. But when they waited for the clouds, it was too late. He appealed and he asked the people to come, but they didn't come. And finally, Noah and his family went inside. The door of the ark was closed. And then for seven days, everyone made fun of Noah. But then the rain came. And the thunder began to crack and the clouds gathered. And water began to pour in great cataracts from the sky. And it began to explode out of the earth. And there was this terrible flood that changed the whole planet. And the only ones that survived were the ones in the lifeboat. You know who the lifeboat is in the last days? Jesus. Only those in Christ, the Bible says that, will be saved. We must be in Jesus. We hide in him. He is our savior. He is our lifeboat. So we're going to go through our lesson and talk about how do we give our hearts to the Lord? How do we get on this lifeboat? First question, what has God done for us to make a lifeboat for us? Now, we've read this verse before, John 3, 16. Do you want to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, we read those verses. You know those words. But what does it mean when it says he gave his son? It was very painful for God to lose his son. Years ago, 1937, there was a man named John Griffith. He operated a railroad drawbridge over the Mississippi River. Most of the time, they kept the railroad bridge up until he got the whistle that a train was coming. He signaled back, bring the train along. He would lower the bridge so the train wouldn't have to slow down because they needed to keep the bridge up for all the ships and the boats to go through on the Mississippi. Well, one day, John brought his son Gregory with him to work. He was a young boy, about five or six years old. And um, they were having lunch together, and he was showing him the machines, and he wanted to see how Daddy worked. And just then, he heard the whistle and the radio go, say a train was coming. He said, okay, you sit tight, and you can watch the train go by. The father went up, and he radioed back, tell the train to come on through. It's the Memphis Special, 400 people on board. And... You don't need to slow down. He said, I'm here. I'll lower the bridge. So the train started coming and the father was up there. He hit the switch and the drawbridge machine and the cable started to lower. And then he heard, help, daddy. 
And he looked down at the machine and he was horrified to see his son Greg had not listened to him. He got up and he went to watch the machine move and he didn't realize there would be a cable going behind him and the cable had a broken piece of cable that was like a little hook. It grabbed his clothes and it began to pull him up towards the machinery. Gears, pulleys. The father saw the train whistling and it was coming towards him and he thought, what do I do? If I stop the drawbridge, that train will never be able to stop in time. The cars and all those people are going to go crash off into the Mississippi and many will drown. If I stop the machine and save my boy, the people will be lost. If I don't, my son will be lost. He had a terrible decision to make. He decided that he would sacrifice his son to save all the people and he let the bridge go down and his son died. He had to listen to his son and say, Daddy, help me. And he couldn't save his son. And then as the people went by in the train, there was a glass booth there where they could see the operator, they could see John Griffith and all the people were waving to him as they went by and they didn't realize that he just gave his son so that they could live. So many people in this world don't realize how much Jesus gave so they could live. And he says, if you love me, then give your heart to me. He's happy to die for you because he loves you. Bible tells us that the life preserver is Christ. You can actually read in Jude verse 1, we are preserved in Christ. Jesus is our life preserver who saves us. So how much does Jesus love us? Does he really love us that much? Does he love me personally, you might wonder? I know he loves the whole world, but I'm not a very good boy or girl. Maybe he doesn't really love me that much because I'm pretty bad. Well, I'll tell you, if you knew me when I was your age, I was a real scoundrel. I used to steal. My grandmother caught me one day. I stole a bow and arrow from a drugstore. And she said, I don't know how you got it out of the store in your pants. But somehow in, under my clothes, I hid the whole bow and arrow. She took me to the police station because I had such a problem stealing. She said, you better put the fear in him. They said, if you don't stop stealing, Dougie, we're going to put you in jail and you'll eat bread and water. I said, I don't care. I like bread and water. And my grandmother whispered to the policeman, tell him he's only going to eat canned peas. Oh, I hated peas. And the policeman said, all you're going to get is water and peas. I said, oh, I'm going to stop stealing. <laughs> I don't want to steal anymore. But I was a, I got in a lot of trouble when I was a little boy. But you know, I came to realize Jesus loves me so much, he would have died just for me. He loves you individually so much, he would die just for you. The Bible says in Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us in while we were sinners, Jesus died. He didn't say when you get to be good enough, then I'll die for you. He loves you. You know that song, Jesus Loves Me? I'll tell you my verse. Jesus loves me when I'm good, when I do the things I should. Jesus loves me when I'm bad, even though it makes him sad. Yes, Jesus loves me. Good or bad, he loves you. Nothing separates you from the love of God. He says, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. God loves you more than you love anything. It's so hard for us to even understand. He says, you are precious in my sight. There is no created thing, Romans 8, 38, that is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Someone asked a question about a sheep. I'll tell you a story. In uh, Scotland years ago, there was a lighthouse keeper. And his job was to keep the lighthouse light burning. Every now and then, the lighthouse was over 100 feet high. And every now and then, it was right on the coast. And there were some fields where some sheep would graze nearby. And... Uh, he, uh, he was out on top of the lighthouse one day. There's a little railing that walks around the top so he could wash the windows and keep the windows clean on the lighthouse. And he was walking around and he was cleaning the windows and he leaned back and he didn't realize the railing had gotten so rusty from the salt air had corroded it that it broke and he fell. And as he's falling through the air, he thought, well, that's the end of my life. Then he woke up and he thought, I must be in heaven. He saw clouds floating by in the blue sky. And then he thought, if I'm in heaven, why does my back hurt so much? And he kind of shook himself awake and he realized he didn't die. 
he landed on a sheep. <laughs> but the sheep died. And he felt so bad that big, fat, fluffy sheep broke his fall, and so the man lived. You know, Jesus tells us, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Lamb of God. You read in John 1 29, John the Baptist, when he introduced Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to take away our sin. Now, how exactly does that work? I need a, a, a couple of uh, people here that will come up here with me. No, I changed my mind. Put your hands down. Why don't you bring the table up? You know what? I'm thinking about it. This is not a good idea. I'm going to use chemicals. All right. I wonder if this will work better than the egg experiment. Poor boy ended up with egg on his foot. Could have had egg on his face, though. All right. So, here you've got Jesus. Here you've got sin. Here you've got you and me. So the Bible says, though our sins be like scarlet. And so I'll just put a little bit of it in here. And the more you put in here, you can see it's starting to turn. It gets red. So sin, it contaminates and it pollutes our lives. But no matter what happens, Jesus was tempted by the devil many times, but you notice he never sinned. The devil tried and tried to tempt Jesus, but it wouldn't work. But when you and I get sin in us, you know, it just, it makes us worse. More sin, darker it gets. But if you put the sin in Jesus, it, sin, the Bible says God is not tempted with evil. Every good and perfect gift is from God. God doesn't sin. Makes us worse. But the solution is, I wonder what happens if you put Jesus. Oh, no, there's not near enough sin in there right now. Let's, I want you to see that. Okay. You know, we're living at a pretty sinful age today, so I thought I'd just... But what happens if we accept Jesus into our lives? While we were yet sinners, Jesus loved us. He comes into our lives, and He purifies us. And someday, what is Jesus going to do to the sin in the world? And the whole universe is going to be clean. And if you use that, that'll clean your clothes, too. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to get my, uh, get my helpers. To... It's a miracle how God cleans us from sin. You know, somebody asked the preacher, Billy Sunday, one time. They said, how can the blood of Jesus wash away my sin? And you know what he said? I don't know how a black cow can eat green grass and make yellow butter, and white milk. Black cow eats green grass, makes yellow butter, and white milk. He said, I don't understand it, but I enjoy ice cream. You don't have to understand it all to enjoy it. It is a miracle that God takes away our sins. But trust me, He did it for me. He will do it for you. Number three, what did Jesus come to do for me? The Bible says, God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And this is the love of God. Not that we love God, but it starts because of His love for us. In that He loves us, and He sent a Son, this is a big word, to be the appropriation. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, why is this so important to us? Because the penalty for sin is death, but God is offering us a gift. A gift of eternal life. All right, I need a volunteer. 
Let me see here. I, I'm going to go find some. some you, ha, you ha, can't. But if you've raised your hand before, let me see here. Uh, young man right here. You can come up. Okay. Now, nobody, you're getting a really special opportunity right now because several people have been in the treasure chest, but nobody's been in the captain's cabin. You know, this boat, the SS or HMS Adventure, has a lifeboat. Are you strong? I want you you're pretty good. Go in there. There's a, a little lifeboat in there. Open that door and look. I want you to see if you can find the lifeboat. You got to pick it up. It's a little heavy and bring it out with you. Do you see a little boat there? That's it. All right. Very good. That's a good boy. He even closed the door. Well trained. What was your name? Jaden. Jaden? Okay, Jaden. I want to tell you a story. There's a boy. That's not too heavy for you, is it? Okay. There was a boy, he built a model boat. He, he lived by the river. He loved sailboats. And so he spent a lot of time and he carved and he got the sail and he sewed and he made himself a model boat and he put it on a string. And he'd let it go out in the river when the wind was blowing a little bit and he'd sail it up and down the river and he'd pull it back across again. He had so much fun with his boat. This was years ago. One day the wind was really blowing and he didn't have the string tied very tight. And the boat blew away from him. And uh, his beloved sailboat drifted down the river. And he was so sad. He had spent days and weeks making it. And now it was gone. A couple weeks later, he was in town. Town nearby where they did their shopping. And what do you think he saw in the window of one of the pawn shops there? There was his boat. And he was so excited. He went and he told the man, he said, that boat, that's my boat. Man looked a little troubled. He said, well, maybe that's your boat, but someone sold it to me. And I paid $20 for that boat. He did a really good job making the boat. He said, but it's my boat. And the man said, look, I bought it so I could sell it and make a profit. I'll make you a deal. I will sell it to you, sell it back to you for the same price that I bought it for. And uh, he said, $20. He said, $20. Well, he would mow lawns for 50 cents. So how many lawns did he have to mow? 40. 40. Some good math students. He had to mow 40 lawns. And finally, he came back and he handed the man $40. He didn't realize his boat was so much, worth so much. But as he walked away, he handed him $20. Thank you. He, he didn't realize his boat was so valuable. And he walked away and he looked at his boat and he started talking to you. He says, you are my boat. He says, you are double my boat says, you are my boat because I made you. And you are my boat because I redeemed you. I bought you back. It says, you're my boat twice. I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you a better boat tomorrow. Are you coming back? You come back tomorrow, Jaden. I'm going to give you a boat. This one's borrowed for the night. How's that sound like? You got a deal? All right. Thank you very much. Let's give him a hand. Poor Jaden had to just stand there and hold the heavy boat. And so we belong to Jesus not only because he created us. We belong to Jesus because he redeemed us. Jesus owns us twice. So he loves you so much he made you. He loves you so much he even bought you back. Don't you want to belong to someone that loves you that much? How do I accept Jesus and truly show that I believe in him? What do we do? Well, the Bible says, ask and it will be given to you. When you pray, all kinds of things happen. Now, have you sometimes wondered, are my prayers actually heard? I need a couple of volunteers. All right, we've had a few boys up here. Let me get a couple of girls. I'm going back. I'm going long. All right, let's come back here. I see a, a hand back here. You can come up, young lady. And uh, all right, have you not paid and picked yet? All right, come on. You, you can come on up. Look in the treasure chest and see if you see something that you can communicate with. And wave at the camera. Yeah, see, there you go. What's your name? Gloria. Gloria? And you're? Alyssa. Alyssa? Okay, let's, let's make sure these are turned on and working here. Sounds like it's working. All right. And let's see here. Thank you to 3ABN. 
All right. I want you to take a walk, and I want you to go out halfway up the church and ask Gloria. Okay, Alyssa, go just walk halfway up the church and ask Alyssa on your walkie-talkie. Talk. You have to press the button when you talk, and you don't have to press to listen, and ask, do you hear me? All right, right try it right there. Talk in the walkie-talkie. Press the button and say, do you hear me? Are you pressing the button? Press and say, do you hear me? You know what? Oh, he's going to show you which button is. <laughs> I should have showed you that. Do you hear me? Now you press that button. You say yes. Yes. Can you hear her? All right, go, go out in the foyer. Go, keep going. You're going to think this is very elementary. Now press the button again. Ask her, do you hear me? Do you hear me? You know, talk real loud. Say yes. Yes. Okay. Go out in the foyer. Go out of the church now. All right, you can shut the door. Ask her again. Do you hear me? Yes. You, she's not going to hear you like that. You got to say yes. Yes. Okay. Did you press the button when you said it? Yes. Okay. Go outside the church. <laughs> Do you hear me? Yes. All right, I want you to go home. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You can come on back in now. <laughs> so, ask her, does she still hear you? Do you hear me? It's like a cell phone. It's just, you know what a miracle this is? How can words travel through the air? If you were to show this to the Apostle Peter, what would he think? Or the Prophet Daniel? If you tried to explain radio waves, I'll let you hold that for a second. If you tried to explain radio waves to people that lived 200 years ago, could they understand? If you explain to them how right now TV pictures are going through the air and appearing somewhere else, if you showed that to someone 200 years ago, they would have burned you as a witch. <laughs> right? But you know what happened? We've learned that there are things that we didn't understand before that you can't see. Can we see God? But is He real? We can't understand how our prayers might go from our mouth to the ears of God, but He not only hears when we speak and we pray, God hears when you pray in your heart, doesn't He? Can you think of someone in the Bible that prayed in their heart? The Bible says, Nehemiah, when he was before the king, he sent up a prayer from his heart. And God answered that prayer. You can pray in your heart, but it's good to pray out loud. It scares the devil when you pray out loud. So the Lord hears us all the time. And the Bible says if you ask, it will be given to you. He hears those prayers. Thank you very much. I can't give these to you because they're not mine. Appreciate it. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, girls. So if you want eternal life, do you have to climb a mountain? In order to get eternal life, do you have to whip yourself or crawl on your knees? No. Jesus says, what do we do? Ask. Right there, ask and it will be given. If we come to him, there was a thief on the cross who was dying next to Jesus. And you know, he prayed one of his final prayers. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And did Jesus hear his prayer? Yeah. And he promised he would give him everlasting life. Acts 16.31, ask and what else do you do? believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So it's not just asking. When you ask, believe. Let me tell you a story. When I was a young Christian, I was 17 years old, a little older than most of you when I accepted the Lord. I didn't know much about praying, but when I realized the Bible was true, I learned from reading prophecy, I would pray the most amazing things. I was standing on the road hitchhiking and I said, Lord, please help me get a ride from Oklahoma to California. I need some money and some food. As soon as I finished praying, car picked me up, took me 2,000 miles, almost 2,000 miles, fed me all the way out and gave me money. And I didn't ask for it. I'd asked the Lord. I remember I was with a friend one time. We were, I had no money. We were playing the guitar and begging. I played the flute. My friend, his name was Doug also. Doug played the guitar and I played the flute. 
And I was telling him about Jesus. He said, ah, I'm not so sure I believe in Jesus. He said, I believe in, you know, reincarnation. And he said, I said, no, Jesus is real. I said, Doug, I'll prove it to you. He said, how are you going to prove it to me? I said, well, we're trying to get some money to eat, right? So he said, yeah. I said, how much money do we need? He said, well, it'd be great if we got $4, we could probably eat in a restaurant instead of just going to the supermarket. Back then, you could eat $2. You could buy a meal in a restaurant. And so, I know it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, Taco Bell, you're still pretty close. So, I said, I tell you what, Doug, I'm going to ask Jesus to give us $4, and he's going to prove that he's real. I had so much faith back then. I believed. So, we saw a lady walking up the street in Palm Springs, and she was a dignified-looking lady, and we started to play. I played my flute. He played the guitar. She stopped for a moment to listen, and when we got done playing... We said, Miss, would you have any spare change? We'd like to get something to eat. And she looked a little surprised by our question. She said, normally I wouldn't do this, but you're both about the age of my son. And so she reached in her purse and she said, how would $4 help? And Doug looked at me. And after that, Doug started praying to Jesus. And we, I saw so many miracles. When you pray, things happen. Sometimes the answer doesn't come right away, but you look back and you say, oh, God answered our prayer. God has answered thousands and thousands of prayers for me. Believe. So what's the most important prayer you can pray? Lord, forgive my sins. Accept me as a child. And give me the gift of everlasting life. And he will do it. Why don't more people ask for it? He wants to give it to them. And why do we love the Lord? We love him because he first loved us. When you look at the cross and you see how much he loves you, it makes you want to love him back. The Bible says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. When we see his goodness, we become aware of our badness and then we're sorry. Now, uh, it's important that, you know, who knows what repentance means? Repentance means being sorry for your sins and a willingness to stop. For example, like if I'm walking in this direction and I realize I'm going the wrong way. See, I went to military school. They taught us how to do about face. And then you walk this way. Repentance is when you turn around. And so repentance means you change directions. Yeah. And you're on the road to destruction. You change directions and you follow the Lord. So, telling the Lord you're sorry. How many of you remember every sin you've ever committed? Well, not too many of you can remember all your... No, you don't remember all your sins. Uh, most of you can't remember all the sins from one day. So, do you have to remember and confess all of your sins? The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But who remembers all their sins? So, what do you do? Uh, I need someone to help me. No, this won't be too tough. You, you can come up front. Uh, this won't. And what's your name? Gabriel. Gabriel? Mm -hmm. Okay, Gabriel. Now, if, we, if we're walking out of the church and you step on my foot, go ahead, step on my foot. Ow! What would you say to me? Sorry. Sorry, okay. But if we're walking out of the church and you push into me and you knock me down, <laughs> would you just say you're sorry? Or would you say, let me help you up? Let me help you up, right. So if we're walking out of the church, I didn't tackle you too hard today. If we're walking out of the church and I'm carrying a load of books and you're running out of the church and you trip me and I fall and I break my arm, would you just look back and say, sorry, and keep going? Mm -hmm. oh, you would? <laughs> All right, I need somebody else up here. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> now, if you've knocked me down and broke my arm, you just say sorry and walk out? Why don't you try and say, well, let me see if I could call an ambulance for you or something, right? I mean, if you step on my toe, you just say, I'm sorry. And I say, that's fine. No problem. If you trip me, you help me back up. If you break my arm, you do a little more apology. You stay around. So let me help you. I'll call the doctor. I'll... You're going to run off and leave me, huh? All right, you can sit down. I'll... I... Let me see if I can illustrate this. The bigger the offense the more sincere the apology. If, if you trip somebody 
by accident, you say, I'm sorry. If you bump into someone, you say, excuse me. If you really hurt someone, you need to really say you're sorry. So how much have we hurt the Lord? God gave His Son. So repentance means a real heart sorrow for the sins that we've committed against God. And then the Bible says that we confess our sins to Him and He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'll tell you a story. Do you confess your sins to God because He doesn't know? Does God know everything? So why are you confessing your sins to Him? The same reason that he would say, I'm sorry when he stepped on my foot. When he stepped on my foot, I know he stepped on my foot. He knows he stepped on my foot, but it's appropriate to say, I'm sorry. When you sin against God, we need to tell God we're sorry. When I was about four years old, I lived with my father and my brother in Southern California. My father had a shoe shine machine in the upstairs hall. It was it was a, like a, a chrome silver machine. It had a big black furry brush on this side and a big red furry brush on that side and a button on top. And my dad, before he went to work, he'd walk into the hall. He'd step on the motor. He would go, the brushes would spin really fast. It was powerful. He'd put his shoes under there. He'd buff them. Then he'd step on it and he'd go to work. I was fascinated when I was four years old with that machine. I'd never had so much power in my control. And when no one was looking, I'd sit there and I'd hit the button and go Whoosh! and I'd try to stop the brushes with my hand. I couldn't. My hands would get so hot from the friction. And then I'd turn it off and I'd turn it on. I had so much fun playing with that shoe shine machine until one morning. Yeah, there I was. I woke up Sunday morning before everybody else and everyone's sleeping and I'm bored and I walked out of my bedroom. I walked into the hall. There was a shoe shine machine and so I sat there and I turned it on. <laughs> turned it off. Tried to stop it. Turned it on. And I thought, it's a shoe shine machine. I should shine some shoes. So I tiptoed into my father's bedroom. He was still snoring and I grabbed his black shoes that he kicked off there by the bed and I brought them out and I shut the door and I was going to buff them and I thought, I'm almost sure that dad's got shoe polish in the bathroom under the sink. I'll use shoe polish. So I went in the bathroom. I left the shoes there. I went in the bathroom under the sink. Sure enough, there was a bottle of shoe polish. Now this was not the kind in the little can where it's wax. This was the liquid shoe polish that had an applicator on top. But I didn't understand all that and somehow I got the lid off and I was smart enough to know black shoe polish goes on the black brush. So I poured a generous amount of black shoe polish on that black brush. Got it good and wet because I wanted the shoes really shiny. Then I hit the button. Something terrible happened. First of all, the machine began to bounce because all the weight of the wet shoe polish was on one side and it started to hop. And then it picked up speed. It went and it discarded all of the polish. All the polish just sprayed off the brush. It went up the wall through the middle of a very expensive Spanish soldier picture, some Spanish conquistador. Across the ceiling, back down the other side of the hall, it just created a black rainbow <laughs> in the hall. And I quickly, I hit the button and turned it off. And I looked at that and I thought, it's probably time to go back to bed. <laughs> I went back in my bedroom and I crawled back into my bed and I'm laying there under the covers. I'm thinking, nobody saw, nobody will know that I'm responsible. A little while, it took forever, but pretty soon I heard my dad stumble around and I heard the sink go on in the bathroom and then I heard his bedroom door open and my little heart was going like this and I thought, I'll just pretend I'm asleep. And he walks out into the hall and then I hear, <laughs> he made these noises I'd never heard before. <laughs> and he went right to my bed. Oh, not, it's still on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I don't think that was me. He went right to my bedroom door and he opened up the door and he looks and he goes, Dougie? And I wondered why he said me because I had my brother, I had my stepbrother, but he went right to me. He said, get in here. 
I acted like I was asleep. Dougie! Oh, yeah, I was. <laughs> and uh, I came out, and he pointed me to the rainbow that looked as ominous as ever. He said, do you know anything about this? I wanted to tell the truth, but I thought, no, man, he, no, no one will know. I said, no. He said, are you sure? I don't know. I didn't, well, what was? What happened? I thought, you know, someone might have broken into it. Is that me? No, I don't think there's something else going on. <laughs> anyway, I thought someone maybe broke into my house and a robber might have tried to steal my dad's shoes and shine them before he left. <laughs> Anything could have happened. And my dad said, all right, Doug, I'm going to spank you until you tell the truth. There was a convenient bench right there in the hall where he used to put his shoes on. He sat down and he pulled me over his knee and he began to swat me on my posterior. You all know where that is? That's your gluteus maximus derriere. And, uh, and I was going, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I did it. I did it. I did it. <laughs> because, uh, you know, we all crack under torture after a while. And then my father used to cry, and he said, stop crying. Go in the bathroom, wash your face. So I went crying off into the bathroom, and I had a little stool I used to stand on so I could see into the sink. I was still pretty small. I stood up on the sink to wash my face, and I'm looking in the mirror. I had black spots all over my face. <laughs> Here I am. I'm looking at my father. I got black spots all over my face. He says, do you know anything about this shoe polish? I'm going... No, not me. Can we get away with anything with God? No. It's like sometimes your parents say, did you get into the chocolate chip cookies? And you're going, mm-mm. You got chocolate chips all around. You know, not me. <laughs> your parents usually know, right? You always want to tell the truth and confess your sins to God. You don't have to hide anything from God. So be honest with Him. Tell Him what your sins are. And he will forgive you. He's very merciful. The Bible promises as many as receive him. So you ask, believe, and receive. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. Will my life change when I give it to Jesus? Shh, shh, guys. Will my life change when I give it to Jesus and join his family? What does Jesus help me do? If anyone is Christ, in Christ he is a new creation. You become a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. You're born again. And Jesus said, then if you love him, because you're a new creature, because of the love for God, you want to keep his commandments. It actually pleases you. Now, all of you have been born once. How many have been born at least once? That should have been everybody, right? You know that if you're only born once you will die twice. The Bible says you will not only die the first death, but after the millennium, you die the second death. But if you're born twice, you may only die once. And you may not die at all if you're alive when Jesus comes. You must be born again. I read about a little girl. Her name was Macy Hope McCartney. She was actually born twice. She was born twice as a baby. You see, when her mom was about five and a half months pregnant, they did an ultrasound x-ray and they found out Macy had a very dangerous tumor that was growing on her spine. And she was only about that big. She weighed less than a pound. Probably weighed as much as a 50 cent piece, a silver dollar. And the, um, the doctor said, unless we do this surgery, she won't survive, but it's a very dangerous surgery. We need to operate, take Macy out of the mother's womb do the surgery, put her back in her tummy again. And they did that surgery, and it went perfectly successful. She's now a very happy young lady. So she was born in March. They put her back, and then she was born again in May, two months later. So she was born twice. But you need to be born twice spiritually, and Jesus does a surgery on your heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. God has known us from the very beginning. Will I be happier when I accept Jesus? 
Oh, infinitely happier. John 5, 11, these things, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that your joy might be full. And again, and yet the tables, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Being a Christian can be a happy life. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And then we say, Lord, he says, I have come that they might have life, Jesus said, and we might have it more abundantly. God wants you to have an abundant life. I need two volunteers. Okay. I, you know, I'm neglecting you guys way over here. I feel so bad. I'll tell you what. Well, we got like five girls here. All right, so. And here, I'll you, you take you because you were sitting down. All right, all right. Look in the box there and see if you can find, one of you see if you can si find something to start a fire. <laughs> that scares people, I know. Look around, see if there's something there that might start a fire and wave while you're there. You found it. He's got it. All right. I picked two of you because I got two candles here. All right. Do you think you could light that thing? It takes, you got to have a pretty firm grip. You pull in the trigger, you squeeze, and you press the button. Come on over here so people can see. Pull the handle in like this. Let's just pull the handle in. Just squeeze the handle in. Go ahead and light it. Try it again. Try it again. There you go. Keep going. Try it Don't give up. Land it again. Stay with it. Stay with it. You're not going to run out. All right. Now, let, let uh, what's your name? Adara. Adara. You can see if you can light the other one. Squeeze it real hard. There we go. Keep it squeezed down. Don't push it over. <laughs> That's good. You got it. All right. Now, here's a question. Come on over here with me. You guys, we can set that down. Um, can you see something different with those two candles? One's taller, all right. Which one do you think is going to burn longer? Okay. Which one do you think is going to give more light out over time? Taller one. So here's my question. What is worth more? 10 plus 70 or 70 plus 10? Sounds equal, doesn't it? Now let me tell you what I'm talking about. Are you better off being 10 years old, giving your heart to the Lord and serving Him for 70 years? Or being 70 years old, giving your heart to the Lord and serving Him for 10 years? You want to do it when you're 10 years old, okay? Uh, here, like, I got something for you. Yeah. Since, oh my gosh, she's a girl. Isn't that pretty? Do you like that? Isn't that beautiful? I don't know if it smells. I think it's an iris. And what was your name? Huh? Luke? I got one for you too, Luke. Now, they're both irises. Which one looks better? <laughs> well, I guess that's a matter of opinion. Well, that's, it's no contest. Let's admit it. So if you're going to give your life to the Lord, do you want to give your life to the Lord like that in its blossom and its youth? Or do you want to wait until all the petals fall off and say, here, Jesus, I'm going to give you my life. Will the Lord take you at any time? But isn't it better to give him your life in your youth and your strength? I say this because some people say, I'm going to live for the devil. And when I'm old before I die, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. That's a terrible mistake. You're not going to shine for God for very long. He'll accept you. But how much better to give him your life in your prime when you're young? I wish I was even younger when I had come to the Lord. I wasted several years. And you never know when your life's going to end. You can't decide well, maybe when I'm old, a few years before I die, the doctor will say, you've got six months to live, then I'll give my life to the Lord. You want to give it to him, not just for you, because you want to serve him too. Amen? Or you got to keep that one. You can keep that one too if you want to. Yeah. But sorry about that, Luke. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Thank you very much. I remember once a story a father was sailing through the Caribbean with his teenage boys. And uh, he told them, don't be running around the ship. Don't be getting in trouble. He says, if you fall overboard, this is a dangerous area. There is a chicken slaughterhouse near here. And because there's a chicken slaughterhouse, 
there's a lot of sharks in the area because all of the garbage from the chicken slaughterhouse goes out in the ocean and the sharks are very thick and they are very aggressive. Well, the boy said, okay, Dad. Dad was always being really cautious and having rules and they said, yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. They didn't believe him. Well, as they were going along, the boys began to run, chase each other and play tag on the boat and they were wrestling or fighting or something and one of them began to slip and go over the little cord railing. He grabbed his brother's t-shirt they both fell off and the boat was going, it was under sail, it was moving. They both fell overboard as the boat was moving and went splash into the warm Caribbean waters. Well, they were good swimmers and water wasn't that deep. The father heard the boat splash. They said, hey, Dad. He ran up from below. He was in the kitchen, the galley down below. He came up and it took him a minute to try to lower the sail and stop the boat. It's not that easy to stop it right away. The boys were off in the distance and the father's trying to turn the boat around and he got up on the deck and he said, swim back to the boat. He dropped the sail and the boat was slowly drifting and they're going to swim back. Well, they're out there in the water dunking each other and fighting. They were enjoying being in the water. And then the father saw from where he stood sharks. And he said, boys, I see sharks. Come quickly back to the boat. Swim calmly but quickly. You don't want to stir the water too much. The boys looked at each other and they said, we haven't seen any sharks all day. I don't see any dorsal fins going through the water. There are no sharks. He's probably just trying to scare us. And so the boys began to say, oh no, help, I'm drowning, sharks. And they were making fun of their father. And they're slowly swimming back to the boat. Well, the father saw, he's getting really frightened because there are more and more black shadows under the water that are gathering and circling the sun. And he understood the nature of sharks. Sharks are kind of cowards, but they'll circle and one of them eventually will go in and take a sample bite. But once they smell blood, they go into a frenzy of biting and tearing. And the, um, the father saw the sharks were closing the circle. He said, boys, get back to the boat. And he picked up the life preserver, you know, the ring, and it was on a rope. He said, are you having problems? He threw it to them and they said, oh, we don't need that. We can get back on our own. And then he saw the sharks were going to dive in in any moment and, or, and uh, attack one of the boys and he knew that would be the end of it because now there were like 50 of them. So the father did something that was very shocking. He took a fish knife that was on the boat. He cut his wrists. He dove in the water and swam in another direction. And soon the dark shadows all went over towards the father and the water began to churn and turn red and the boys saw what happened. Now here's the question. If they choose to stay in the water after their father gave his life, is there anything more their father can do? If we choose to continue hanging around with the devil and stay out in the world after God gives his son, Jesus gave his blood to save us, is there anything more he can do? So, God's done as much as He can do in giving Jesus to save us. And the only lifeboat is Christ. Jesus is our lifeboat. We must come to Him. The Bible says, He who has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. So do you see how much Jesus loves you? Don't you want to accept Jesus and start living a new life for Him? You know, the Bible tells us that without Him, we can't do anything. But how much can we do through Christ? All things are possible through Christ. Now, if you come to Jesus and you accept Him, I need to ask you a question. Did you get some cards when you came in tonight? You did. Could I borrow one of your cards? Oh, Mrs. Bachelor's got one for me. Thank you very much. I forgot to ask for a card. You know, we did this early in the program. I do it usually three times when we do a special program like this because I don't want anyone to be missed when you hear the opportunity to dedicate your life to Jesus. Just so you know the statistics, over 50% of the people who make a decision to follow Jesus do it before the age of 13. Meaning, if you wait until after that age, the percentage goes down. You get out in the world, people get busy with life, they get caught up in the sins of the world, they often forget about God. The best time to get on the boat is when you're young. I'm going to give you that opportunity tonight. And also those of you who are watching on television, you have that opportunity as well. Now here's some questions I want to ask you. You can make a decision tonight. You give them your heart when you give them your mind. 
If you would like to make a decision tonight and say, Lord, I want to give Jesus my heart and follow his teachings and his word, just check the box on your card. And we're going to have special prayer for you. Don't forget, if you have any kind of writing device, some pencils are in the pews here. You want to write that down? If you don't have anything to write with now, I hope you'll fill this out and give this to your division leader. Secondly, you'd like to make a decision maybe to get baptized or plan on it, something you'll talk to your pastor and your parents about. I'd like to be baptized and have all my sins washed away. We'll talk about that another night. And if you'd like to know more about what it means and to be baptized or get more Bible studies, just mark that there. You might have some special prayer. You could even write on the back. Put your name and your address and at least a way to contact you, email or phone, because we want to follow up. We want to help you answer all your questions so that you can know what to do to prepare for Christ's coming. If you've made a decision to accept Jesus, remember you ask, you believe, you receive, then what do you do? What are the steps after you accept Jesus? Here they are. Talk to him every day in prayer. Does he hear us when we pray? Secondly, let him talk to you through the Bible. Read your Bible. The Bible tells us that uh, they search the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You read about God, Jesus in particular in the four Gospels, but read about the truth. And then you know, one of the things that's often forgotten, one of the most important steps, after you make a decision to accept Jesus, tell somebody else about it. You want to share the good news. It says in the Bible, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, you will be saved. So seal your decision by sharing and tell someone else what Jesus has done for you. His promise is he will never leave you or forsake you. You know, God has given his own son because he loves you so much. I remember hearing a story about um, a boy. His sister had a rare disease, his younger sister. And uh, the doctor said, Tommy, you have the same blood type as Lisa, your three-year-old sister. The only way that Lisa's gonna live is if you would be willing to give her blood. And he thought a long time about that because he was only like eight or nine years old and he thought, boy, kind of scary when someone pokes a needle in you. And, and he said, yes, I'm willing to give my blood to Lisa. So they laid him down in a hospital bed and, and he was starting to tear up when he thought about it and the doctors to put the rubber band around his arm and they, they got where they found a vein. They poked a needle and he cried a little bit and he saw the blood running down the tube into a bottle. And he said, doctor, is it going to hurt to die? And they said, well, you're not going to die. He said, but after you take all my blood, won't I die? They said, they're not going to take all of your blood. You just need to give a little bit. You'll be alive. And he was so relieved. He was willing to die to save his sister. He thought they were going to take all of his blood. That's what the Lord does in the heart of somebody when they love someone. He loved his sister so much he was willing to die for her. Do you love Jesus so that you're willing to live for him? He's got a special plan for you. I would like to pray with you as we close and well as those who are watching. Could you just bow your heads with me, please? Loving Lord, we just want to thank you for uh, your presence, your spirit. Thank you for the love you have for us and that you gave your son. Thank you that you have the power to wash away our sins, to give us new hearts, to help us experience a genuine conversion. I pray for each of these young people here. They'll make that decision to choose to invite you into their lives and to walk with you every day. Bless them. Bless the teachers and the leaders and pour out your spirit on this whole camp meeting. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.